If you've ever heard me say the phrase, yeah, your audience isn't going to care about you until you give them a reason to care, that's me quoting Joe Polizzi. He is the man behind Content Entrepreneur Expo and many, many books, and he's on the show today. How cool is that? Get your pencils ready. It's a good one. Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting since 2005, I am your very own personal podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you are new to the show, this is where I help you plan, launch, grow, and monetize your podcast. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. And if you go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener, or just use the coupon code listener, yeah, that's going to save you on that monthly or yearly subscription. And you can join absolutely worry-free. So if you're like, nah, I'm not sure, nah, nah, 30 days to figure it out, and I will give you your money back. And today, if you don't know the name Joe Polizzi, you should. He writes really good, great books. He makes really good podcasts. And I'm so excited to have him on the show. So let's not waste any more time. Here's my talk with Joe Polizzi. I'll tell you what's really cool about this. Number one, great author, Content Incorporated, Epic Content Marketing 2. Don't get the first one. And then you you actually just wrote a novel, The Will to Die. He started Content Marketing Institute and Content Marketing World and then sold it. And then now, in fact, May 5th through the 7th in Cleveland, Ohio, right up the street from me, you've got Content Entrepreneur Expo. We'll be talking about that but here's what I was like, you know what, Joe Polizzi is a good guy because I was getting ready to like buy everything you have. And it says at the bottom of your website, it says, I've published other books such as Killing Marketing, Managing Content Marketing, and his first book, Get Content, Get Customers. And you basically tell people, yeah, don't buy those. For that, I say thank you. You just kept put some money in my wallet. And uh, Joe Polizzi, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And thanks for mentioning that because honestly, for authors out there, I wish more authors would do that. And obviously, this is not a fiction author thing, but for business books, a lot of authors write business books that are no longer relevant. I've got three of them. So, <laughs> so just, just don't, don't do that. It's great to finally chat with you, Dave. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. The other thing I forgot to mention, because I read it every time it comes out, the tilt, and I quote it religiously all the time which is a newsletter for content entrepreneurs. And tell us a little bit about that. Let's start there. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, after my wife and I owned Content Marketing Institute, and we, we sold in 16, and then I exited by 18. And I promised her I would never start another business. So <laughs> that didn't work out so well. Because you're still COVID married? Came, <laughs> COVID, yeah, I know. COVID came around and I was getting into, like you said, I was getting into writing thriller novels and I'm really proud of The Will to Die. And I was working on the second one, but things happened during COVID and I got into this whole creator economy thing. And I started to get a bunch of incoming from friends and colleagues about, hey, do another version of Content Inc. And I'm struggling here. Can you help me? And I was doing a little consult. And I, would, I basically, they brought me back in <laughs> and I couldn't get away. And, uh, and then I started, well, I said, well, if I'm going to redo the book... I might as well start a business. So we started the tilt and it was a planned as an email newsletter for content creators who wanted to become content entrepreneurs. So not hobbyists, like serious content creators that this is your business thing. And we did really well with it. It's got 32,000 subscribers right now. And it's, we got a great team behind it. And then we decided to do the event CEX, which you said is coming out, coming up in May in Cleveland. And I got back into it, Dave. And I don't know what to say. Yeah. Besides, I thought I it was mistakes. the house. <laughs> they pulled me they back in. Keep pulling me back in. That's right. That's the. Is it the Godfather three? Is that three or I, I two? Think I think it's it. three. And yeah. you, you are, you are called the Godfather of content marketing. And the one thing I want to ask about that, I'm going to throw you some softballs here. What is content marketing for those that are like, wait, I've never heard this phrase. So content marketing is you could sort of think of it as the opposite of advertising. So in advertising is you're you're basically calling on somebody else's channel. It's somebody else's magazine, somebody else's news show, somebody else's podcast. And you're saying, I'm going to place an advertisement in that pay for the right to do that. Content marketing is different where you're creating the show, you're creating the magazine, you're creating the newsletter. It is yours and you're selling your own stuff in that. 
So basically, your whole goal is to build a valuable, relevant, compelling, ongoing show to build a loyal audience that knows, likes, and trusts you and ultimately will buy anything. So that's the whole idea behind content marketing, which, you know, when I started getting into content marketing in 2000 and 2001, wasn't even a thing. But as social media took off and Google took off almost simultaneously in the mid 2000s, there were all these companies that said, oh man, well, how do we get found? How do we build audiences? What do we put in all these pipes, in these social media pipes? And I'm sending on email newsletter and and it's all sales stuff and product stuff and nobody's paying attention to it. And I want to start a podcast, but I don't have any good things to talk about because we're talking about our, our own stuff. It's the whole idea of, hey, let's let's not talk about your own stuff. Let's talk about your customers' pain points and what keeps them up at night. Build that audience. And then from there, you can actually sell stuff. So that's a long-winded answer. To I've been in this industry way too long. That's <laughs> basically what that is. You said one of the things that we always hear people say, you know, well, you have to know your your customers, your listeners, whatever it is, you have to know their pain points. And there are some people like, well, okay, well, how do I do that if I don't have, you know, if I'm just starting out a brand new business or, or a brand new podcaster, how do I figure that out if I don't have an audience yet? Well, I mean, hopefully you have an idea of who your audience is. But like in Content Inc., we say, okay, you start with your sweet spot. Like what is your expertise area? And then what is your information and needs of your audience? And the combination of that will get to hopefully some content mission statement, like an editorial mission statement where you're saying, oh, I'm going to talk about this. And it's in this format, audio format in a podcast case, case. And it's targeting to the audience and the audience should get X, Y, or Z out of it. So you're really talking about audience outcomes. I'm trying to help my audience member get a better job or live a better life. You're not actively selling your stuff on it. That's the difference. And that's why our content marketing got such a bad name because you see all these podcasts created and these newsletters created, which were just additional sales tools. And I'm like, you're doing it wrong. You don't sell yet. You build the audience. And then naturally part of that, your customers are going to want to buy from you because you're helping them live a better life and get a better job. That's the whole idea behind that. And that's why, I mean, honestly, between you and I, nobody else, you know, we're, we're, this is not like going out anywhere, right, Dave? Like we <laughs> no. can talk about the real stuff. Most <laughs> companies are really bad at content marketing, like terrible because they just can't get their products out of their way and say, what, how can I help my customer outside of my product and solution? How can I help my customer today? They're only going to buy your product and service for a very small portion of that time. What do you do the other 99% of the time? You better send them something really amazing in the form of a show. That show could be a newsletter. That show could be a podcast. It could be a YouTube channel. It could be TikTok. It could be an event. It could be whatever. But focus on that and then you're setting up your own marketing. You're creating your own future customer list to sell to if you think about building the audience first and then selling to that audience second. Oh, amen, brother. I always say it's plan, launch, grow, then monetize. And a lot of people yep. don't a lot of people don't plan. They just launch and then they want to monetize and they kind of skip the grow part. And I'm like, yeah, you that just is not the way it works. And in the tilt, you had a study and you said that the number one way entrepreneurs are making the most profitable thing, I guess we'll put it that way, was they were selling their own products and services as opposed to advertising. And I quote that all the time because everybody's like, I'm going to start a podcast. I'm going to get ads. I'm like, let me give you some stats here. I guess the balance then is, okay, so I want to sell my own products and services, but how do I do that without kind of stepping over the line where you're talking about bad content marketing is when we're just talking about me. All right, I'm going to do that Dave thing where I interrupt. That was a decent question. Hey, Joe. We're supposed to sell our own products and services, but we can't just talk about ourselves. What's the balance? But instead, I didn't shut up and I turned what was a decent question into a mm, okay question and I made it a yes or no. Is it as simple as I'm just going to do an ad spot and that one little ad spot's going to be for me? That's a, You could be that simple. And that's the way that I like it, actually. I, could, I mean, by the way, thank you for your comments about the tilt. So we're on issue number, I don't know, 1,000 or something that we've sent out. And we sell our own products and services. We have sponsors, but we sell our own products and services. We sell courses. We're launching a, a book and print till publishing coming out pretty soon with the whole thing. And we treat it like an ad. We're like, here, 
If you were a media company, how would you do it? Here's content, 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 really solid editorial. And then here's an ad. I think people are okay with that. Or on a podcast, I don't have a problem with at the end say, hey, here's how you find me. Or have you heard, or like in the beginning, you and I are having banter. Maybe you launched a new product or service, but it's very natural. And people are okay with that because you're delivering so much value. It's just like, oh, we're going to do a YouTube show and it's going to be a, a product demo. And we're going to have a customer at the end talking about how great it is. Well, that's not content marketing. Mm. That's something else. That's just promotion, which is fine, by the way. You can do that. There's nothing wrong with advertising. I'm, I use advertising all the time. Advertising still works. More money spent on advertising than anything else out there. Yeah. But think about this as a little bit different. So if you're saying, okay, how do I do this really well? Find your favorite media company. Like I love Morning Brew. Mm-hmm. I, I open Morning Brew newsletter every day and I get a good feel for that. Well, if Morning Brew says in there and they do it as well, like right at the end, here's we're selling these courses. We got this event coming up, whatever. I pay attention because they deliver me so much value. So just think about it that way. It's just like, I think as a human being, you sort of know what's, what am I going over the line a little bit? But to, just to end this part of it, what I love about once you build that loyal audience, you can monetize that audience 10 different ways, right? Yeah. Advertising sponsorship, launch my own event. I could do it through affiliate links. I could sell products. I could sell services. I could do donations if I wish to. Right. You could do a lot of different things. And that's what's amazing is because it gives you so much flexibility to make money once you build that loyal audience. The thing that always gets me about the tilt, you just did one March 8th. I'm really looking into website stuff. I haven't really, I've kind of ignored my website for a few years. Like it was up and running. I got it and I know it's never over, but, and you just put on an episode about a bunch about SEO and links and keyword research and blah, blah. And it was like, this is exactly, how does Joe know this is exactly what I need right now? (laughs) Because Joe has an amazing team. (laughs) That's exactly how Joe knows. Speaking of that, you know, okay, so now I've, I've got my podcast out there. I'm promoting my products and services. And there's the the old joke, right? That 50% of my marketing works. I just can't figure out which one it is, right? Is it this one or that one? Do you have a favorite tool to try to solve that problem? I look at it as wherever you have your core base, so you're building your platform at, and then you have an email offering. Mm. Like if, if any creator out there is starting today, and it's so easy to start because... The technology is is so inexpensive and all these social channels are quote unquote free. Mm. It's like, okay, so like, and you have a say in where you want to get this started. I say it's like the Harry Potter sorting hat. Like you might be really good at something, like maybe you're better audio or better on video, but you have a say in it. Like you could say, oh yeah, I don't want to do the video thing. I want to do the audio thing, or I want to do an email newsletter, whatever. So figure out where your show is going to be, figure out, okay, this is what it's going to be about. This is the audience where there's where we can be one of the leading experts in the world and deliver something amazing to that audience. And then as part of that, that call to action is a regular email newsletter. And this is so simple, Dave. This is not rocket science. It's been done by media companies for the last 20 years. That's the model. They basically build a website or they build a podcast show or a YouTube show. And then they say, and get more of us through the email newsletter. And what that does is it has them control a little bit of that business model. Because if they start it on, let's say, YouTube, YouTube could kick them off at any point, right? Could kick you or I off and change the algorithm. Once I'm doing great, then I'm not. They could say, okay, well, you got to pay tomorrow. You, you never know. I, I just talked to a friend today who had 80,000 subscribers on YouTube and he lost his channel entirely and never got it back and had to restart. That's horrible. Just to think about all the work it takes to get to 80,000. So you want to make sure you have that email newsletter. And when I say email newsletter, I don't mind just collecting emails. I mean, sending them something amazing at least every other week. And if you do that and you have your core base show and then your email newsletter, that's a pretty simple scenario for success. If you do that for the next 9, 12 months, 15 months, I think you'll start seeing, oh, hey, I've got an audience here. They're signing up for the newsletter. And then you can start to monetize from there. There you go. And don't you have another newsletter? I think it's the orange. The orange letter. Yeah. Yeah. That's my personal, my personal newsletter. So yeah, that's where I get to talk about whatever I, whatever I want to talk about. I took a page out of your, you know, book or whatever. 
And because I started my newsletter, I'm like, I don't know what to, to talk about because if I start talking, then it's, you know, it's this 12 page newsletter. Nobody wants to read that. So I started just writing a paragraph about here's what I'm working on. Here's the horrible thing that happened. Here's the great thing that happened. Oh, and by the way, here's everything I just did. And I've had people tell me, I like your newsletter because I can read it in about two minutes. And it was just simply, I heard you talk about the orange newsletter. And I was like, well, he's just given like the, here's. It's what I think. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how I don't think people value their time. And I was talking about how many the statistics on people that scroll through social media and they don't value their time and what they could do with the time. So that, that kind of thing. I, last week, I talked about the Bitcoin because I'm, you know, I'm into little cryptocurrency here and there. And oh. I just said, hey, you may not understand it. Here's a video I think you should look at. So that kind of stuff. And so basically, I usually have one content creation tip. I have one like marketing tip. And then I have one life tip. I talk about goals a lot. But actually, Dave, I'll tell you why I did that. Because my wife and I sold CMI. And we sold CMI in 2016. CMI had over 200,000 email subscribers at that point. It was a very valuable company. We sold the event content marketing world. It was a great exit for us. But then... I had nothing. <laughs> I had not. I mean, I had my social channels, which I have 150,000 followers on Twitter that are mean nothing because I that doesn't go to I could right. do it. I lost all my status on on Twitter because I didn't uh, I didn't tweet regularly. And, and I guess Elon doesn't like me. So whatever. And then I said, OK, 2018, 2019, I'm like, what do I do? I want to talk to my friends and family and colleagues and I want to create a thing that's just mine. So on JoePolizzi.com, I created the newsletter. And now, thankfully, I think it has like 46,000 subscribers or something like that. We're doing really well. But it took a long time to get there. And now I'm like, whatever happens, if I ever start a thing and sell it, if I ever decide to go anywhere else, if I ever got shut out of any social media site on the planet, which I always think is going to happen, I have this list of amazing people that I'm connected to. And then it's your choice on how you want to do it. And luckily, people see value in it. And they keep, I love getting responses and I love this and and I get family and friends that are signed up to it and they give me crap about it. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Favorite thing. Well, and, and you've mentioned, you know, YouTube, TikTok, you know, there's Instagram, Facebook, you name it, they're all there. And I know so many people that get really stressed out because they're trying to do everything. And I, I personally, I have been on and off TikTok and it's just, it's always the thing. And if I have more time, I'll go over and do some some talk face, some book chat, whatever they, you know, the next one up. Uh, <laughs> and you've kind of got a different strategy on that. Talk a little bit about that. Well, and this is through a lot of interviews with a lot of successful content creators and marketers on how they've done it and been successful. And I call it, basically, we all have a set number or amount of what I call content energy. And no matter how much budget you have or how much time, everybody has sort of the same amount of content energy that they can put towards things. So it's basically, if you're most content creators and you want to do this as a full-time business, you said, okay, I'm spending time on Twitter X, I'm on Instagram, I'm figuring out Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm doing my podcast, I'm doing a YouTube show, I just launched this research project, I've got an event, I'm going out and doing speaking. I mean, I'm already tired, right? This is so... <laughs> So it, when you when you lay all that out and you say, I'm spreading my content energy to eight, nine, 10, 11 different things, what happens? And the answer is nothing happens because you're mediocre at best on any of these platforms. And in order to break through all the content clutter out there, you have to be great at at least one of those things. Great to that audience, delivering something amazing to that audience, one of them. And you can't do it if you spread yourself those so thin. So you have to make a decision. You say, okay, what are the things that I'm going to say no to so I can say a big emphatic yes to one or two and be amazing? And what's funny is I used to do this content marketing consulting and I used to get hired to come into these billion dollar companies. And they said, Joe, come on in and then give us the big content idea. Like what? Can, what's the show we can start? <laughs> like, what is it a podcast? Is it YouTube? Is, what, what are we going to do? And every time I would say, well, you're going to have to cut some things. That's really like I would say, mm. you've got a couple things over here that really have potential, but you're spreading yourself so thin with all your resources and time and energy that you're never going to get great and build an audience there. So chop these five things off, reallocate those resources over here, and then consistently deliver over time and you're going to see success. 
that's what I've done. That's what, you know, when I interview people for Content Inc., that's what they've done. And then once they build what we call a minimum viable audience or an audience large enough that you can monetize against, then you can diversify. And by the way, Dave, this is just media 101. So if you look at any yeah. successful media company on the planet, Huffington Post, the way that they grew, New York Times, Morning Brew, they all started by doing one or two things really well, focusing on one audience. And then once they build that audience, then they diversify and they become these big media companies. Yeah. A lot of the stuff in your books, to me, the things why it resonated is it was like simple, blunt, and, and perfect in a way. Like one of my favorite lines is, yeah, your audience doesn't care about you. And I was like, wait, what? What? But everybody loves me. Wait, what? And it was like, until you give them a reason to care. And so every time I see a podcaster open up an interview and they go, so Joe, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'm always like, oh, here we go. Cause now Joe's going to be like, oh, I was a paper boy and you know, my dog's name is Tippy. <laughs> and I'm like, and then they don't edit it out. And so you want people to engage with your content. You want to engage them, right? So it's, again, kind of a, a marketing 101, but what do you consider engaging content? To be honest, I don't care about traditional engagement like I have to have feedback. Mm. What I'm trying to do is to get a real good sense and feel for who my audience is. And then if, whether you call that a buyer persona or not, right. or whether you have a picture of what your your perfect customer is or audience is. I don't care how you do it, but you have to figure out something where this is the person. These are the challenges that they have right now. And how can I deliver an insane amount of value to that person to help them? Mm. By the way, it usually doesn't mean your product. We talked about this. So how do you really figure that? And I'm writing things down and I'm doing surveys and I'm going and checking out Google and I'm figuring with chat GPT and I'm getting all these listening posts where I can figure out Oh, this, this is what my customer is dealing with. This is what my audience is dealing with. And then I can put together an ongoing editorial calendar and deliver on that every time. So that when I, and then when I go out to promote, I'm never promoting me. Like I'm always promoting, here's an answer to this problem. Here's something I'm really struggling with. Are you struggling with it? Here's some, some things I tested that maybe will work for you. It's just, that thing, like, how can I, like, I get up in the morning, I say, how can I deliver more value than I'm taking? That's it. It's just like simple humanity. But a lot of people are like, and I get it, right? It's like, I got a quarterly budget to make. I got to sell the things. I need a number of leads, whatever. And I'm like, okay, I get it. But take a deep breath out. We'll do the leads somewhere else. And we'll just focus on creating something that's really going to help your customer. And how can that be wrong? The worst case scenario is they're going to like you more. It might, you might have trouble like figuring out how it's getting to sales, but we'll get there. Like we'll figure that out. And I'll, a really good example is, is that we launched Chief Content Officer Magazine when I was a CMI in 2011. And we're launching a print magazine in 2011, even then was a risky thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to show when we're trying to get together is this thing working? Like, is it doing anything for the business? So what we found out, and it took us two years to get this data, up, but we found out that those customers, those companies that were getting the magazine were sending more people to Content Marketing World than average, and they were spending more when they got to Content Marketing World. They were higher yield customers. And I'm like, isn't that the greatest thing ever <laughs> to say about a print magazine? So it's those types of things that I love. But again, you've got to, you know, we had to set, I could, I was the founder of the company. So I could say, we're going to wait on this. But if you go into most companies, they're don't. It's like, rush, I, I need it right now. Well, if you need, like, if you came to me and said, Joe, I love this content marketing stuff. I want to do it right now. What can I expect in six months? I would say nothing. You should <laughs> expect absolutely nothing to happen. You got something great, better than most. Are you having fun doing it? Yeah. I did a deal with a very large company in Chicago for a magazine. This is back in 2004 or something like that. And they said, well, we don't want to do the two-year deal for the mag quarterly magazines. We want to do one year and two issues. And I said, I can't help you. Mm. I said, I don't believe that will work. You're going to send two issues in a year and then you're going to see if something works. I can tell you, you're not going to see anything. It, you're not going to get enough data then. You have to... Deliver amazing things to them seven, eight times a year, nine times a year in print format, whatever it is, you have to deliver amazing value. Two times isn't enough. They probably forgotten 
thought you spammed them if they ever subscribed to it. Same thing with email newsletters. So it's those types of things that we're still dealing with today because of this mentality of I need to get the business today. And if we just say, hey, focus on the audience for a little bit, customer, those things will come if we do it the right way. Well, I know this is part of Joe's greatest hits and, you know, we want to hear the hits. So it's, it's your favorite question. How long does it take to grow an audience? And then, of course, the follow up to that is, especially if you want to monetize. So we, we know a couple things. So we've done some pretty good research at The Tilt with Ann Hanley and Jay Klaus. And we found out that it generally your number to get to monetization that you're comfortable with. So basically, the business is growing and it's throwing off some cash. That number was 18 months. And I still think that's low, Dave, mm. because most of the people I talk to, they're saying two plus years, in my case, four years with Content Marketing Institute. I mean, I, mean, I was doing a lot of odd jobs until we, till I knew that I didn't have to work for somebody again. And I guess I would treat it like any small business. Mm. Most small businesses fail inside five years. It takes about three years for a small business to make it. Content creation, I've got my phone here. You and I are talking right now. Right now, this technology hasn't cost us all that much because we've been using it so long. You know, we're, we're talking online or internet doesn't cost us that much. All those things. But honestly, we've got to bake in more time. So my wife and I started in 2007. We had to make some really critical expense judgments. It's okay. Let's get rid of the car. We're not going on the vacation. She calls it the bologna and ramen noodle years. Like really <laughs> cut down expenses so that you can make it. Now, maybe, and I talked to a creator today. They did a million dollars in revenue in 12 months. And I said, congratulations, you're a one percenter. Yeah. I rarely meet people like you. I don't know how you did it, but congratulations. Because I don't know that model. That is foreign to me. My model is more like Mr. Beast's model. Not that I'm Mr. Beast or anything, but Mr. Beast started in 2012, right? It took him four years to get to 30,000 subscribers. It took him two years just to figure out what the heck he was going to talk about on a regular basis. Mm. Five years, he got to a million subscribers, still not making money. And now he's worth a billion plus <laughs> dollars. That's after 12, 12 years. Yeah. Take the long -term, uh, game approach, get expenses down, figure out some odd jobs so you can make it there. Have a good support from your spouse and your family. And, and you can then be part of one of the best businesses ever. And that's the content creation business and be a podcaster and do all the wonderful things because you and I love this stuff. Yeah. But set yourself up for success because it does take some time. It sounds like you've tried a lot of things over the years. Do you have a favorite out of all the things you've tried that just failed to such a, a horrible word, but it just didn't work? that you learned the most from? Man, that's, well, wow. I don't, this is a whole different podcast if we're going to talk about <laughs> Joe Polizzi and the number of times I've failed. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. The tilt.com and the newsletter, it's doing great. I'm, I'm very proud of what the team and, and I've created 32,000 subscribers, good open rate. We get a lot of positive feedback like yourself. It's wonderful. But it, took us a long, way longer to monetize and way longer to be any kind of profitability than I thought, because I'm like, oh, hey, Joe Polizzi, I got a big audience here. I'm coming off a big success. I know this model. I've, I teach this model. I do this whole thing. And I'm two years into this saying, why, am, why are we not making money hand over fist with this thing? I have some answers to that about why, if you want to know, but I even like, I probably would have done it completely differently if I had to do it over again. Now, I'm happy with this community. I love this community. My favorite of all time. I would never. But if I had a do over, I don't know if I would have done it the same way. I think I would have not started it. Or I would be right now my third novel or something like this. It's incredibly hard business. But if you do want to know why, what I would do differently. Yeah, I'm going to say I'm going to you got me all peaked now. So, yeah, what wasn't working? And you'll hear his answer right after this. So I know and a lot of the players in content marketing and have for I mean, I've been in for since 2000. So I, I know the players, I get content marketing, I get the philosophy and the methods and all those things. 
getting onto the creator economy side and working with individual creators is a different thing. And I was taking what I learned and moved it over, but I did not realize the vast amount of resources available for content creators coming from so many different companies all over the world that we were competing with. So I'm thinking, oh, it's funny because it's called the tilt. I'm thinking, oh, we've got a really good content tilt, which means we've got a really good differentiation area that we can break through all this clutter and build an audience and we can monetize this really quickly. But we really did not. What I found out after the fact is that there were hundreds, if not thousands of really amazing resources out there. And I couldn't say, oh, if we really do the work, which is what I ask creators to do, I said, hey, if you find your content niche and really do the work, can you build an audience and say, hey, we're one of the leading experts in the world? I thought starting out that we could say that at the tilt, which is the way we positioned it, really focusing on content entrepreneurship. But a lot of people talk. Now, I think we have a very unique way to do it, and I'm glad you like it, and we got a great community. But when starting out, we didn't have enough differentiation. We were going to too wide of an audience. I would have focused on a different content niche. I would have focused on a more, a way smaller audience than going after just content creators. I might have picked an area of financial or home services or civil engineering or whatever, something different where we would have had an advantage in a moat instead of just going out and saying, oh, we're competing with not only other creators, we're competing with our sponsors that we're going after and we're <laughs> creating with other companies and media companies. So right off the bat, we're create, we're competing with 5,000, 10,000 different things. It's like, there's too many. Like, look at, like, I love Content Entrepreneur Expo. We'll get 400, 450 amazing people at that. But you know what? There's a lot of other events out there that do a lot of similar things. I think ours is the best, but I could see if somebody else looked and said, Joe, there's 72 other events out there just like this. And I can't persuade them differently because there are 72 other events going to that audience. So again, I would say it's my recommendation. If you're just listening to me whine about this stuff, I would say, really look at your content tilt. Like really look, do you have the, a niche there? You can say you could be the leading expert in the world. If you do this, do you have an audience that's small enough where you can understand their pain points and needs better than anyone else? We did that really, really well at Content Marketing Institute. Didn't do that as well at the tilt. And we, we had to backtrack and really change things so we could we could do that better. Well, you mentioned, you know, your your event coming up here in May, and I'll have links to all this stuff and his books and everything else. It'll be a very long show notes page. But tell us a little bit about the event that's coming up in May in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. In Cleveland, Ohio. I'm really I get to host the event. I do the opening keynote and host it May 5th through 7th in Cleveland, CEX. It's at the the Renaissance downtown, which is my favorite hotel in Cleveland. And it's completely renovated. And we're the first event in the space. So I'm really excited about it. But basically, three days of workshops for content creators who want to be content entrepreneurs or full-time content entrepreneurs who are like, how do I build audience? How do I grow revenue? How do I figure out AI? I think we've got eight AI sessions alone, plus a workshop on AI. We've got a workshop on book publishing. We've got a, the Andrew Davis coming in and doing a great workshop on how to be a professional speaker and get more speaking revenue. So it's basically all the things that you and I just talked about. How do you build a loyal audience? How do you monetize that audience, audience in four, five, six, seven different ways? How do you future-proof your business model so AI doesn't eat you for lunch? Like <laughs> all those things. And I'm really excited that we've got a good dissec dissection of people coming. We've got about 20% that are doing 500,000 or more. And we've got 20% who are just getting started. So we've got we got a sessions for all those people. And you've got the Jay Klauses of the world there and Justin Welsh. And, and we've got BJ Novak from The Office, who's our closing keynote, and a lot of wonderful people that are that are coming. And going to put on hopefully an amazing show and just have fun with it and network and my favorite community. This is the best group of people I've ever met because they all want to help each other because we're all trying to build this wonderful small business and not have to work for somebody else. It's kind of the goal. The other thing I just wanted to bring up is I love the fact that you have a novel and and the novel is not about how to get customers. You know what I mean? It's 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 not a business book. So a lot of what we talked about today, I think a lot of people are going to just connect that, oh, that's a business thing. 
So how does this apply to someone that's doing, I don't know, I, I don't know why I'm stuck on movie podcasts, but the last two weeks I've been... Like a consumer side Yeah, stuff, the consumer or? side, I'm just, uh, it's an entertainment show, it's, it's fit and 50 over 50, or, you know, or it's the psycho cinema show uh, where we talk about really bad movies, you know, the, the typical podcast yep. stuff. Because th- the advantage of looking working at Lipson is I get to hear a lot of podcasts. The disadvantage of that is I'm hearing hear a, lo- a lot of podcasts. I- I'm hearing a lot of people's <laughs> first podcast, which isn't fair to anyone. Yeah. But to the person that's kind of doing marketing that way, do you have any insights on that? Yes, I do. And what I would say is I want you to think beyond just the podcast. I want you to think about what what's in it for you? Like, what is your, I I call it an exit strategy or begin with the end in mind. What do you want out of this whole thing? If you want this to just be a wonderful hobby where you're getting on a podcast and like to kick off a little bit of cash, good for you. You go do that. You be that person. But if you want this to be like your full-time thing where you're generating a hundred, 200, a million dollars a year, and you've built a full-fledged media business around it, well, that excites me. Like, I like that. Because that's the greatest business on the planet, but you have to make some different decisions. So you're not just thinking about, okay, you've got the show, but what, what is, what is the end of that? What's the end all be all of that show? You're going to build this loyal audience. You're going to hopefully have some kind of e-newsletter where you can have one-on-one conversations with those people and deliver directly to those people from an opt-in standpoint. You're going to look at, okay, well, I've got 10 different ways to generate revenues. Okay, well, in a podcast, how many do you have? You could sell products and services. You could sell advertising and sponsorship. You could do a lot of other things too. Maybe maybe your industry for your 50 plus car show or your crazy dessert show, or I'm an, I'm an amazing, I'm a runner over. I have a friend of mine who just started a podcast, Runners Over 60. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to talk. I'm like, okay, great. It's not just a podcast. This is a mission where you're really trying to help people. This is a media property that you're going to build. The first thing is the podcast, but then we want to look at what this model is going to be. You build that loyal audience. You have the email component. You look at the 10 different ways that you can generate revenue. How do you support yourself until you get to a minimum viable audience? I want you to ask those questions now because what are you doing? Like, Go back to the beginning. What are you doing this for? Write this down. Review it every day. I mean, you might you might know this because you know a bit about my background, but when I started in 2007 and I left corporate America, I didn't know exactly what that long-term goal was going to be. Well, I read a couple books. I read Stephen Covey. I read Napoleon Hill, a couple other ones, and I wrote ended up writing down my goal. And my goal was I sold, I do it in the past tense, I sold Content Marketing Institute for over 15 years million dollars by 2015. Very audacious of me. I wrote that down in 2008. Didn't have two nickels to rub together. I I read that thing to myself twice a day for seven years trying to, because it shaped everything I did because that's what my goal was because I wanted generational wealth for my kids and my family. And I wanted to build this media company. And I said, that's what I'm going for. So I don't have to work ever again. If I don't want to, I want to do it on my time. But I had to read that ongoing. And I found, Dave, that most creators and entrepreneurs don't have that. They've never spent the time and said, well, yeah, I know I like this thing and I like my podcast and I like being a content creator, but give me the big picture. And it doesn't have to be an exit. Like you don't have to sell your, like what's the perfect ideal of your life? Do you want to do a nonprofit? Do you want to spend more time with your kids? Do you want to take care of your parents? Like, what is it? So write that down. And then strategically start to make sense, start to make plans with your podcast to get you to that point. And that's what I'm trying. Like if the most important thing I work with content creators on has nothing to do with content creation, it has to do with business planning for entrepreneurs. Mm. Because that's what you are if you're a podcast owner. You are an entrepreneur and you're doing the greatest thing ever. And if we treat it like that, I think you'll be more successful. Beautiful. If you want more Joe, and I know I do, Content Inc. podcast, and then this old marketing podcast. And of course, come to Cleveland. How many network parties are going on at night? So we have we have 
to ourselves. And so we have the opening reception that is Sunday night, the 5th in Cleveland. And that'll be wonderful. And I'm doing a live taping with Robert Rose of This Old Marketing. So we're going to have a little fun there. And then Monday night, we're having an 80s party after the, you know, the day's events, if you will. And that's going to be my favorite restaurant in Cleveland, Pickwick and Frolic. Mm. So we're having that there and we're going to use the martini room and there's going to be a lot. So what I try to do, I've been, as you know, I've been in the events industry for a long, long time. And education is really important. And you'll get the best education from the best content creators on the planet. But the most, most people go to events like that for networking. They're trying to find a couple people that can help them build their business. And that's where we try to set up a, a number of situations, even for you introverts out there, where you can feel good about talking with some other people and sitting next to the right people and asking some questions in a, in a format that's not going to make you feel weird so that they can help you along your journey to build your business together. Excellent. I want to say it's CEX, but it's not. What is the website for your... Uh... Oh, C- yeah, CEX.events. Oh, dot .events. So, so go to, yeah, go uh, to... Okay. If we're, yeah, so I'll do the quick promotion, <laughs> CEX.events. And if you decide to come, I would like to meet you there and talk to you. Use coupon code JP100, JP100. That'll get you $100 off if you pick the conference pass or the all access where you get the workshop and the videos mm-hmm. and everything. But I'd love to... I mean, it's my favorite thing is just talking to other creators and we're all on the same journey together. And it's interesting, kind of like you, you know, you, you've been working on podcasts for what, since 2005 or something like yeah. that. Like you, like you probably, you're only doing that because you enjoy talking to other podcasters That's about the business of podcasting. Yeah. Cause you, if you didn't enjoy that part, you wouldn't be doing this. And I believe the same thing about content creators. I'm like, I think this is the greatest job on the planet, working for yourself, building an audience, helping people, not feeling bad about selling to them. I mean, that's the greatest thing ever. So I like that. I'm, I'm just like you in that respect. Well, I just love the fact that, you know, we're all in our spare bedroom talking into a microphone and there are times <laughs> when we feel like our own little freaky people, like nobody, you know, you're parents are at Thanksgiving going, it's a what, you know, you know? And so when you get around other people that are doing the same thing, you don't feel like it's like, okay, everybody else is going through the same struggle. It's not just me. And that can be so true, really engaging. By the time you get home, you're like, okay, plus you've, you've had all these great sessions and you've hopefully taken notes. Don't, please take notes. please. And then the, the key is when you get home, do them, do something a little bit do every something. day. Yeah. Do a one thing or something like that. What 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 you said resonates. I just you just talked about this yeah. in my newsletter. I'm a big Billy Joel fan. Love Billy Joel, and I love the fact that he released a new song. Yep. Why did he release a new song? He started talking to another songwriter, and that collaboration with Freddie Wexler, another songwriter, helped him figure out that he wasn't done writing, and that just gives me goosebumps. I'm like. That's why we do. That's why you can't just always do this in your bedroom or at Starbucks or whatever. You need to talk to other people that are dealing with the same crap that you are every day. So that's why, you know, however you do it, if you do it at CEX, great. But but get together with a group of people that are dealing with the same things you are, and that'll make you a better person, and then it'll make you a better content creator. And I'll have links to all of Joe's books. I'll have links to CEX.events. I'll have a link to JoePolizzi.com. It's all there in the show notes. Joe, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Dave, anytime, my friend. It was a lovely conversation. Oh, you know what's cool about Joe? What you hear on this podcast is what you get. A guy that loves to serve his community. One of the couple things that jumped out at me, I love the fact that he said, The orange newsletter, it's his. Like, he doesn't have to worry about, I don't know, Clubhouse going away or back in the day, MySpace going like, no, that's his. And if the world blows up, he's got his newsletter. And he talked about how going to a community can help you feel less like a freak. He didn't say that I did, but he did stress the importance of community. And I'm here to tell you. People come for the courses, they come for the coaching at the School of Podcasting, but they stay for the community. And then the hard question that we have to ask ourselves is, can we be a leader in this space? And my answer to you is, of course you can. Don't listen to the voice in your head. Now, it's not going to come easy. It's going to take some work, but why not you? You know, so many times we we say, well, nobody's going to, well, why not? Why not you? 
And then my favorite thing he brought up is people will put up with ads. And again, if you are new to the show, I'm not anti-ad. It's just not my first string kind of strategy when it comes to monetization. But I'm going to replay this quote. It was so good. If my morning Bruce says in there and they do it as well, like right at the end, here's we're selling these courses. We got this event coming up, whatever. I pay attention because they deliver me so much value. Not just value, so much value. And I'll have a link to everything out at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 925. Joe mentioned a couple different ways you can make money with your podcast. If that is something you are interested in, go to profitfromyourpodcast.com slash book, and you will see that the audiobook is now available. I'm actually recording it now. You've got about an hour and a half worth of material there now. I'm recording chapters on a regular basis. And the cool thing is the early adopters can then feed me questions for the bonus content. Yeah, check it out. Profitfromyourpodcast.com slash book. And since we're talking about books, my buddy Thomas Umstadt Jr. is doing this the last time. His book, Launch Secrets, is going away. They've been doing this particular class, this course, for seven years. So it's Thomas Umstadt Jr. and James L. Rubert. And if you are a person that is writing a book or you've already written a book and you didn't get much out of it, go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash book launch secrets. And that'll take you over to a presentation Thomas did. And there will be a link there if you want to sign up. The last day to sign up is April 12, 2024. I want to thank Joe again for coming on the show. What a great guy. Looking forward to seeing him. Can I say something that sounds weird? I just recorded this episode. I edited it and put it together right after last week's because I'm going to podcast movement in, you know, basically I'm leaving on a plane in about 12 hours. And it seems kind of weird because I feel like I just talked to you because I I just did. It just, it's a week till this comes out, but I do appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to the show. If you know somebody who's struggling with content, like, what do you mean? What is good content? And how do I get this to work? And how do I engage my audience? Go, hey, you need to listen to this Joe Polizzi guy. He was on the School of Podcasting. You can check it out. You can just share it there with your phone. You can tell him to go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash 924, or even better, have him go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash follow, and it'll be the episode right there they can listen to, depending on, of course, when you listen to that. But it's in there. All the episodes are in there when you follow the show. Schoolofpodcasting.com slash follow. Thank you so much. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. Yeah, here's another little, it's not really a blooper, but I pulled this out because, well, I sounded like an idiot. I I didn't understand why he called the newsletter the tilt. And well, this is what I thought it was. I I totally appreciate that. And when I first saw the tilt, see, I'm old enough to remember pinball. And I was like, the tilt, because that was the thing. If you hit the, the machine, right. I was like, is this yep. the pinball? What's, what, what's Joe doing? <laughs> exactly. You're like, what? Well, <laughs> yeah, if you read Content Inc., it's the second step is the content tilt. tilt. Yeah. I thought it was the greatest URL ever. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, I got the tilt.com. This is amazing. And Joe wasn't doing that in a mean way. I've read Epic Content and now I'm in the middle of Epic Content too. And I will read Content Inc. when I'm done with those. But I thought it just made me look like Dave didn't do his homework. <laughs>